thank you so much. So uh, this story, oops, the story begins uh, 1807 with uh, this document, uh, when the administration of the first French Empire, which then encompassed large areas of uh, Europe, as, as you know, uh, wanted to establish a cadastre for the new empire. And uh, while the first attempt began in 1807, they led to very uneven results. And a cadastre was really a crucial apparatus in this uh, new administration for the determination of a fixed taxable income and was also initially perceived by some spheres uh, as a tool to ensure equitable taxation among citizens. And therefore, for this reason, in 1811, the Ministry of Finance published uh, Reque Methodique, this document, which tried to establish uh, the rules to organize a bit and regulate the cadastration of, of the territory and obtain uh, more even results. They were also typically in this document trying to uh, establish the mechanism of verification of the cadastration process, the scale of the maps, as well as the methods for, for instance, the recognition of owners, and this document is also the first document that founds the concept of urban cadastro. And several pages in this uh, document especially focus on the representation of the figuration of the cadastro. For instance, it specifies that the areas should be colored in carmine, as you have uh, in this little extract, and that also the line should be forced on the shadow side, as we see uh, in this image. Uh, we know also that, for instance, water courses should be colored in green, water green actually, and it was also, for instance, giving a lot of instructions for how to represent the different levels of administrative borders. Other documents were also uh, established sometimes at a local uh, level. For instance, uh, this uh, document uh, from the Vo administration in Switzerland. Uh, and this document, you see, is published a bit later, 1827, but actually it takes almost all the recommendations and the rules from the Roque uh, Methodique. It copies them and it adapts uh, some of them. For instance, they say that the water should be colored in blue in this document. And you might be surprised at the date that is uh, already um, 16 years later, so at the end of, in fact, of the first uh, French Empire, after the fall of the first French Empire. But what is important is to know that what we call usually Napoleonic Cadastre, in fact, extends for uh, uh, at least the first half of the, of the 19th century. And in many countries, not only France, but also Belgium, some parts of northern Italy, uh, Netherlands, uh, some parts of Spain, and so on. Uh, so the first cadastration campaign began in 1807, and then it was interrupted, in fact, almost uh, straight after by the fall of the empire and the economic crisis uh, uh, caused by the Napoleonic Wars. And then it was taken over uh, in uh, 1827, and it's really at this period, in fact, that most of these cadastres were realized. At the end of the century, we have also uh, what we call a renovated cadastre, which is usually an actualized version of these cadastres and takes also some of the codes uh, from this document. So I want to see uh, a bit this uh, project from the perspective of, of uh, the memes, which is an elementary units and replicator of culture. Because we have all these ideas that are replicated in different legal documents and are also replicated in different maps and interpret differently in uh, several places. And Dawkins defines the meme as such. Memes are tunes, ideas, catchphrases, clothes fashions, ways of making pots or of building orchards. Just as genes propagate themselves in a gene pool by living from body to body, so memes propagate themselves via a process which, in the broad sense, can be called imitation. If a scientist hears or reads about a good idea, he passes it on to his colleagues and students. Okay, so in order to study memes, of course, we cannot study memes. <laughs> so we have to focus on what we have, which is physical instances, because memes are abstract concepts, ideas, right? So we have to focus on the map itself and the cartographic utterance that are found in the maps. And for this reason, we gathered a corpus of uh, roughly 1,500 different cadastral maps from the Napoleon Cadastre that spans 19 different cities and region. And what we want to do, we want to normalize these maps and to focus only on the cartographic content, which we do through uh, semantic segmentation by focusing only on the geographic area uh, of the map. And then what we do is we try to fragment these maps into small units that are more easy to analyze uh, in a ways that is quantitative. 
So we fragment this into very small tiles, as you can see here, and we focus actually only on the areas of the map that have at least some graphical content. And then what we do is we kind of sample, so we take not every element on each map, but we take a very large sample that is sufficient to represent a lot of different ways of representing the map through a set of lines, a set of different uh, alphabet letters, uh, textures, uh, shadings, and so, so on. Okay, so from this point, what we want to do is we want to try to find our we want to try to find some coherences, some repeated, uh, replicated figurations. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to define a space in which uh, the elements that are look alike, for instance, the, the elements that are colored in chrome in pink or the lines, the double lines, uh, different kinds of textures are, are quantitatively merged with each other. So, and in order to do this with just don't want to use some sort of black box neural networks that outputs a feature vector. We want to focus on something that is actually interpretable. So we focus on some features that are found in the literature on uh, map vision, actually, uh, and that focus on very concrete elements. So for instance, the color, the morphology, the texture, the line width, uh, graphical load, and orientation of, uh, of the fe graphical features on the map. So we have these features, and within this feature, we will try even more to select which ones are coherent for our exact problem. And in order to do this, what we want to do is we want to evaluate the way in which Napoleon cadastre is found not only uh, in an abstract space or mathematical space, but also with regard to other maps, with regard to the cartography at this time. So in order to do this, we scale up. We take a larger corpus of 10,000 maps from mostly the French area. And these maps, they will describe very different uh, kind of cases. So there are some that are related to the Napoli cadastre, and there are some that are related to, uh, for instance, the Ancien Regime cadastre, or there can be uh, plans. For instance, you have the Jacobet plans of Paris and the Atlas of Paris on the, on the right of these uh, small pictures. You have also like topographic maps, like we realized uh, at the time. So here, for instance, you have the Sigmund Fried map in Switzerland. You have the, the Eta Major map uh, of France. And what we want to do is we know that these series, they have some sort of coherent codes of representation, right? They will use and repeatedly uh, the same icons, the same symbols, the same colors and textures. So we know that they have a coherence and this coherence is also related to the pro production process. They come from a coherent uh, set of authors or organizations, for instance. So what we have actually is we have some sort of clusters uh, that are represented by these series that all belong to the same map. So we have these maps that are part of the series, and what we miss actually is the space that separates them. So we have the clusters, and it's a sort of an inverse clustering problem in which we want to infer the space that ideally dispatches this cluster that we are known to exist, like the Siegfried map of Switzerland, the Atlas plan of Paris, and the cadastre, the Napoli cadastre, that we are known to be uh, different. So we want to maximize the distance between series and to minimize it within the same series. And we do this using an algorithm that is an optimization algorithm that is uh, called the genetic algorithms, and it allows to select which ones of the initial features we can consider that were still candidate uh, interpretable features, uh, which ones of these features allow to answer this question and to separate efficiently this series through space. So through this, we achieve different weights for different uh, features, different uh, relative importances, and it allows really to, uh, to, to separate uh, the, the maps as, as we expected and to give a space that is not something just like taken from the literature and saying, I'm applying, I'm forcefully applying these features, but really something that is allowing to answer some uh, and to, to represent some sort of embedding uh, the space of uh, cartography, ideally. And one thing that I've a bit still uh, hidden in this process is the fact that we are continuously working and navigating between scales. So we have these fragments that are representing the map, and then we have the series that contains several maps. And what we will say is if two fragments are found very close in the same uh, space, we can consider the fragments to be analogous or to correspond to the same type uh, this is uh, directly embedded into the optimization problem. And the second point is that we are trying to find 
what is the distance actually between two maps? What is the distance with regard to styles? So what we say is that if at least one fragment from the map A is found also is analogous to a map fragment of the map B, then we say that uh, we, we add uh, one point to the pro proportions of fragments that are common between both maps. So the idea between this is to get a bit further from the geographic space. So for instance, if you have a house that is represented in a certain style in one map, and in the other map you have many houses that are represented in the same style, the distance is 100% with regard to this uh, single element because the houses are represented in the same way. And no matter that one is represented a city, for instance, with many maps, and that the other is representing just a countryside with just one house, actually. So once we've done this, we have achieved some sort of embedding of the, of the cartographic figuration. And what we want to do is we want to go a bit inside this embedding and see how the elements are spread in a very big space, as you can see here. So if we zoom a bit into this very big and eligible fi figure, what we see is actually this. So we see that the space that we created with these features is allowing to differentiate between very different nuances in kind of different textures, different etched areas. We have also different types of uh, areas filled with little rounds or little dots, for instance. You have different type, kinds of shadings of uh, borders with separate borders and so on. So this space is kind of arranging all the different uh, elements that we can see uh, in a map from a figurative perspective. What can be interesting now that we have finally achieved this sort of embedding of cartography is to see, okay, what is the Napoleonic cadastre now in this space and where is it? And this we can do simply using a frequency analysis. So in this image, the highlighted areas are the areas that are overrepresented in the Napoleon cadastre with regard to the broader map corpus that was a bit more diverse. And if we dig a bit into it, we have something that is a bit difficult to interpret. So we have, of course, some very characteristic elements of the map. We have simple lines. We have some sort of uh, common pink coloring. Maybe we don't see so well. Uh, we have some kinds of separations uh, of the borders, like a yellow border for the separation of communes, like we expect in the Napoleon cadastre. But it's not so easy to interpret, and moreover, it's difficult to link it to actually what they represent. So what we want to do is we want to see the way in which these maps are used to represent different geographic classes. So we performed a semantic segmentation on this, uh, on this map image, trying to classify the different areas of the map into four very simple classes. So the classes are the built environment, the buildings that are here in red, the non-built environment that are here in green and that embed also courtyard places, uh, the water, and the road network. So we have these very four simple geographic classes and we will see the way in which they are represented in the Napoleon cadastre. And we see something like this in which you can observe, for instance, for the cadastre of Enverp or Lille or Lyon, you can see the very characteristic uh, common coloring of the, of the cadastre. And we can also see, uh, for instance, the fact that the line uh, is, uh, is highlighted on the shadow side, for instance, for the cadastre of Lille. And you can see also some sort of outliers, for instance, the cadastre from Neuchâtel. Obviously, it has a very different pink. So it's probably another pigment, and also it using a different uh, font, actually, as we can see here. We have also some innovations. For instance, the cadastre of Horn, we see that they added another color. We see that they use some green areas to represent some sorts of uh, garden areas, which is not planned at all in the, in the Recue Methodique initially. So it's a really a free decision from the local uh, department to add uh, this feature, for instance. And finally, we can try to observe the, the, the presence of some IDs, some of these memes that are found in the legal documents, for instance, the color of uh, the water that is supposed to be more blue uh, in the case of the cadastre of Lausanne than for the other cadastre that are supposed to be more greenish. And we see that actually the difference, for instance, is not so strong. It's slightly more blue if you, if you look a bit uh, more carefully, but there is very few difference actually in the actual in cultural interpretation of this uh, instruction. We can also try to see these differences between the maps as a distance, as graph, actually, because we had defined this idea of distance between different maps, right? So we can see that actually the, the cadastre of Neuchâtel that we 
about which we talked just about, that was uh, outlier, is actually an outlier also with regard to distance. So is also the cadastre of Rhone. And we have the cadastres of Enver, Lille, and Lyon that are the most central ones that were at the top of the previous slide. Uh, and that that probably the more characteristic of the Napoleonic cadastre actually. So in general, we have two trends. We have the fact that the urban cadastres tend to be much more central and much more coherent with each other than uh, the rural ones. And this is important because we said at the beginning that the Recueil Methodique was actually a founding document for urban cadastre, found in this concept. And this is also coherent with the literature and the diffusion of ideas and innovation where uh, ideas tend to diffuse more efficiently between cities than between cities and their countryside. This is especially salient for the cadastre of Lyon because Lyon is found in the department of Rhône and both were found uh, in the previous slide. And we remember that Rhône took some freedom in the representation of the green areas, for instance. So within the same department, there are differences between the way in which cities and the countryside are respecting the legal instructions that they are given. Especially we can have a closer look, a closer reading at Cadastre of Enver, for instance, that is a very interesting case. It is one of the most central cadastre in, in our corpus, but it's not respecting all criteria. For instance, you don't have a, sh the, uh, a higher uh, density line on the shadow side. And the case of Enver is especially interesting because it was a major center for trade. Uh, so the fact that it's also the most central is that the graph is quite interesting. It was also a center for printing, a major center for printing. So the cadastres are not printing, but it was commonly a center to which the different, uh, uh, the different uh, documents would also pass to be printed and reproduced. So it's very interesting in the, the fact that it's central in our graph, and it's also a center for the diffusion of ideas in Europe at that time. Another element that we can also notice is we come back to the graph is the fact that uh, actually the coherence in the figuration is depending also on the time. So consistently, it will consistently decrease over time. So the cadastres that are realized just after the publication of the Recueil Methodique tends to be very co consistent and very coherent with each other. Uh, the cadastres that are realized, like most cadastres in the second wave, tend to be, uh, in average, a bit less coherent. And the ones that are realized at the end of the century, the renovated cadastres, tend to be further apart from each other. So it's extremely interesting because also it shows the role of the Recum Methodique and the cadastration campaign as a centralized role, a role of centralization on, on homogenization homogenization of the cultural conventions, actually, and the con conventions on representation of the map. And once this centralized document loses in its importance to time, uh, the cadastres and the figurations are naturally uh, drifting apart. So we have a sort of a destructive uh, evolution with regard to, to that aspect. Okay, so as a conclusion, we have tried to map the difference between the diffusion of different ideas and link them to the ideas that were found actually in the legal document, the Recueil Methodique. We have also tried to develop a methodology for cartographic stylometry, trying to express the, the figuration in terms of features that make sense also with regard to a space uh, that is a cultural space actually, and link them with the actual concrete uh, uh, concepts and not just to uh, some sort of opaque neural network and features. So I guess it's really this, uh, the, the fact that we are able to navigate also through this methodology between the fragments that we have observed, between the maps that we have observed, and also between the collections that can be seen as a graph of relationships between them. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>